Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk, coming to you live from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. We can be seen in the studios on my Facebook Live page and on the WHBC Facebook. So we're Facebook, we're booked, faced, wherever we are, we're booked. And we're on face. So, hello, everybody. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So, hi there. My name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you are listening and joining us. So, thank you so much for taking the time out. And if uh, you post a uh, an idea or idea that I'm able to see, I'm happy to share that as we go along. So, good morning to everybody listening. All those who are watching, and of course, good morning to Jeffrey Hirsch, who's uh, just stepped in on the Facebook uh, comment page. Thank you. So our subject matter today is somewhat uh, morbid, at least the beginning part of it. It's to, uh, I would like to highlight this and call this um, Judaism and Death, Five Surprising Ideas. On some level of awareness... We all know that uh, a person's days are numbered. So how do we cope with that recognition is perhaps one of the greatest challenges of life. For some, acknowledging mortality is liberating. I think there was some famous uh, hit song lyric that suggested, I wish you can live life like you know you're dying. For others, Fear of the unknown is debilitating and cause for depression. Knowing that death awaits a person negates the hope for the future and destroys the capacity for happiness. In fact, every Sunday at 11 a.m., I have a special class on Zoom that speaks about mindfulness, to be in the moment. If a person lives in the moment in the truest sense, a person lives then in a life of resilience, of happiness, of hope, of uh, depth of life. So I believe that understanding more about death can actually help us live better. Judaism, by way of the profound insights from the Torah as well as from mystical Kabbalistic traditions, grants us some amazing answers to what awaits us at the end of the person's earthly journey. And before I share them with you, I want to say hello to all those who have kindly joined us uh, through Facebook, to Rhoda Sutton, good morning, to Denise Zelikson, to uh, Eitan Kelshevsky, and uh, Gus, good morning to you, to Michael, and all those joining us and listening in all different formats, especially right here at WHBC on the World of Radio. Guess what? So... Here are some five surprising ideas, five surprising ideas about death, which has been part of Judaism's wisdom for millennia. Number one, death is not the end of our existence. Going back to creation, the Torah describes that Adam was formed from the dust of the earth, as well as a breath of God's spirit. So we are all a combination of a body and a soul. It is the soul which defines us as being created in the image of God. So there is a part of us that is eternal and outlives our mortal bodies. It's the part that makes us unique and represents our essence. In the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, it sums us up best. In chapter 12, Dr. Kilshevsky, you'll check me out, chapter 12, verse 7, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, people have asked me, does Judaism believe in life after death? Just come to any synagogue and listen to the rabbi speak, you'll know there's life after death. But seriously, the answer is a resounding yes. In fact, it is one of the fundamental principles of life. Number two. Number two. I hope you're writing this down. At the moment, yes, I see that uh, Kim is writing fervently and, and every word. Do you know how to spell it? Yes. Okay. At the moment of death, 
We, oh my goodness, she made a mistake. At the moment of death, here, here's some more paper here, please, take some more paper. Uh, how, many, how many books are you? I mean, Sean's going to get really upset. There's no more paper left in the studio. Ladies and gentlemen, we're just having a little, little fun. At the moment of death, we get a glimpse of God. See, when Moses asked God, show me, please show me your glory, God's response was, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. The living cannot see, the God, see God. The implication is very powerful. Remember the words, for man shall not see me and live. It implicates and tells us, with death, however, comes a vision of divine. This is the reason behind the custom of immediately closing the eyes of the dead. I remember Oliver Shalom, my father, uh, at being the, uh, the adult, um, I guess not the adult, but the, the oldest son uh, the, at, uh, at the hospital, they said, Rabbi, you go over there and close the lids of your father's eyes. Why would that be? Why would he close the eyes? Eyes which have perceived the glory of the heaven at the moment of passing dare not any longer be exposed to the harsh reality of this world. God's opening words of, the, of creation were, let there be light. Yet the sun was not created until the fourth day. So how, how do we, right? If Wednesday, on the fourth day, light was created, what, what was the light they were talking about on the first day of creation? And the sages explained that this was the light created for the world to come. In the work that I do, as resident rabbi of the NYU Langone Hospital, in, uh, formerly known as Winthrop, I've sadly been at many, uh, many times the moment when people have expired. In almost every case, it appears clear that the person suddenly is seeing a beautiful and comforting vision surrounded by light. I'm, I'm going to share with you something that I, I read. Remarkably, Mona Simpson, the sister of Steve jo Jobs, in a eulogy for a famous brother, reported seeing that very scene. Steve's final words were monosyllables, repeated three times. Before embarking, he looked at his sister, Patty, then for a long time at his children, then his life's partner, and then over their shoulders, past them. And what was Steve's final words were? Oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. What he saw apparently overwhelmed him with its beauty. He could only respond to it with three times repeating this uh, exclamation of amazement. Jewish tradition assures us that we too, when a person at the moment of passing, also has this kind of revelation. Number three, number three. Are you writing, writing that very, very carefully there? You know how to spell three? T, okay. Okay. Uh, the dead know what is happening around them. Jewish sources tell us what happens to us immediately after death. Although much is hidden from us, it remains only in the mystical teachings of Kabbalah, ideally reserved for those spiritually ready for these profound messages, not to be revealed publicly, but only transmitted from student to student. There we find some truths, and some of that, this mystical uh, ideas have found themselves even into the Talmud. And one of them appears in the mission of the second of the section known as the Ethics of the Fathers, where we learn Ethics of the Fathers, chapter 4, 16. Rabbi Yaakov says, This world is like a hallway before the world to come. Fix yourself in the hallway so you may enter the drawing room. The analogy um, of a hallway is very striking. A hallway is but the entrance to a main domicile, right? You have a vestibule, you have an area, you come in. Our lives on earth are the first stage of a more glorious existence. As the Mishnah says, and one hour of pleasure in the world to come is better than all the time in this world. So here on earth, we seek happiness. Our pleasures are transitory. Our joy is limited by our physical being. Once we pass through the hallway of our lives in a manner that makes us worthy of the rewards of heaven, we now are aware of our own selves, of our surroundings, which make our earthly hallway pale in comparison, and of the true meaning of happiness transcending all that we've experienced during our lifetimes. Jewish law goes a step further. Because our soul, our real self, 
moves from one domain to another, we leave this world slowly, forsaking our bodies in stages, and actually in five stages. The moment of expiration, one stage, the moment of burial, number two, the end of the shiva, number three, the 30 days, and then the annual yard site. Those tending to the deceased are not permitted to eat in their presence. You can't do that. It will be a form of mocking the dead by doing something they can no longer do, as they would know it. And we must be careful of what we say in their presence. Why? Because they can still hear it. That is also why the dead should never be left alone, because the soul hovers near the body shortly after its initial separation, and it is aware of the love and the respect shown to its vessel. Of course, we're talking about the body. Judaism also emphasizes that eulogies require special care with their remarks. I work very hard, dear friends, in preparing a eulogy because I know, I know what it means, not only to the family and um, everybody else in the funeral home, but especially to the person in the box because they are listening. And if you start to say baloney stuff and stupidities, you're actually bringing pain to the individual. That's why, by the way, in Chabad custom, no eulogies are said. So it does not bring any pain and an and, 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 and unneeded anxiety to the person who's passed away. During the sh week of Shiva, there's plenty of time to talk about the legacy and all the good things that the person accomplished. But while the person is still in the box, before they are buried, they can hear things. Not just because inappropriate statements uh, might offend the family or the friends, because one of the listeners is none other than a deceased as well. Number four. Kim, are you writing these down? Number four. I'm fantastic. Dying means remembering, reflecting, and facing final judgment. The Talmud tells us, a Kavi ben Mahalal comes to teach us. Again, it's Ethics of the Fathers, chapter three, number one. A person should pay careful attention to three things and you will not come to sin. And it goes on to say, know from where we come, to where a person is going and before whom we have to give a final account and reckoning. Most fascinating is that the Talmud actually reveals the questions that we will all be asked in our final exam. When a person gets up, gets up to heaven, it's no difference than uh, applying for social security or a passport. They ask many, many questions. One of the first questions is, what is your Jewish name? That's, that's why we should always know our Jewish name. And there's actually things that we do every day in our prayers, in our Shemona Esrei, to, with certain sentences that we say to make sure that we know our Jewish names. But here's the list in the final exam included in this uh, a questionnaire, so to speak. The first question is, did you conduct your business affairs honestly? Did you set aside regular time for Torah study? Did you listen to Rabbi Pearl's class? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm getting carried away here. That isn't on the list. Did you ensure continuity of the world by having kids, by having children? And did you look forward to the world's redemption? This is all in Babylonia, uh, Talmud, in the tractate Shabbos, page 31a. And I want to say thank you. We have lots and lots of people listening today. We have uh, Sharon Jacobs. Good morning to you. Barbara Flax. Let's see. Laura May. Wow. Larry Swenson. Labela. Good morning to you. And to Stacy Hirsch Lambert. Thank you so much. And uh, who else do we have you joining us? Michael Weingart. And uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, everybody else is here. Fantastic. Good. So these are the, the discussions that we're having. So not only do we know that one hour of pleasure in this world to come is better than all the time in this world, but we also are told what's required of us in order to attain its blessings. What a remarkable and kind divine gift to give us the questions to our final exam in advance. So you can find it right in the Talmud. And what great advice for living a life of fulfillment which finds favor in the eyes of God and of our fellow human beings. Because you see, the five questions include questions that relate to our relationship with God and our relationship to man. 
Now, number five, the real reason to cry about death. Why then, in Jewish thought, should people weep when they take leave of this, world, uh, this earth? Why cry if we believe that we're moving to a better location? Location, location, location. So one of the sages of the Talmud, Rabbi Huda, explains to his students on his deathbed, if you want to know why I'm crying, it is only because of the Torah and the, and the deeds that I will no longer be able to perform. So the end of the game is, death deprives the person of the ability to continue to serve God and to accomplish acts of kindness. Life presents us with opportunities for personal growth. So death brings to a close our ability to achieve our fullest potential. There's a Hasidic story with a supposedly inside look at what happens upstairs after death metaphorically makes the point very clear. A very rich but miserly man passed away who was standing in line waiting to hear his final judgment. As he watched the procedure with those in line before him, he became far less fearful. He noticed that reported acts of charity had tremendous influence on the divine decree. Gifts given during one's lifetime would outweigh many, many inappropriate things. And so when it was his turn to stand before the heavenly judge, he said, It's true I may not have done all I should have while I was on earth, but permit me to take out my checkbook and write out a very large sum for any worthy institution you recommend. To which the judge replied, Here we do not accept checks. A PayPal, Zelly, no, joking. We only accept receipts. These are some of the profound insights which can replace fear with hope as we contemplate the reality of what a person may, may we all live and be well for many good years. Now, a very uh, a friend of mine recently told me about a fellow with whom he regularly studies Torah with. This particular gentleman is quite wealthy and, to his credit, generously supports a large number of institutions. This friend knows him as a kind, caring, and committed man. Recently, while they were learning over the phone, my friend, who tells me, could sense that his study partner seemed particularly, how should I call it, like bushed, you know. Yeah, it's been a long day, he agreed when prompted, like, like he was in such a mood. I had to really dish it out to quite a few people at the office today. Now this caught my friend off guard. You know me as a kind, gentle guy, he continued, but at work, I'm ruthless. No one gets by me, and if necessary, I will destroy any competition that stands in my way. It's exhausting. I don't think he's the only one. Uh, where do you see them all calm and collective? And, oh my goodness, do you ever see them at work? Mamash, mamash. Vayakel, the Torah portion, begins a narrative that will continue for the next two portions. We review the details of the desert tabernacles. But first, we read about how Moses gathered the people and reiterated the laws of the Shabbat. Moses calls the whole congregation to together and he said six days may you, uh, work may be done but on the seventh day the day of sanctity we are completely at rest and many ask the question why is the first clause six days work may be done necessary the point is to convey the myths of shabbat so why bother talking about the six preceding days moreover resting on the seventh day is indeed counterintuitive but working the other six most definitely is not so why even mention it? Isn't it obvious? In actuality, the words about the work week are not so much an introduction to the following words about Shabbat, but a follow-up to the preceding words of Vayaka. Let me explain. The opening words of the Torah portion tells us how Moses assembled everybody to give them the instructions, lending the parsha its Hebrew name Vayakel, and he gathered. Now, what is gathering all about? That's simply an, enough. Unity, harmony amongst people. The unity is pronounced in our case, for if you look closely at the verse, Moses didn't just gather the heads of the household, 
but the whole community was there. It was a nationwide gathering, highlighting sharing and equality. In this context, that's the next word, six days may we, may, uh, work may be done, are particularly relevant. You see, a common mistake people make is to reserve the spirit of Vayakel, of sharing and harmony for times like Shabbat, when we are more spiritually inclined and there's little competition. In such a setting, sure, why not? Let's be friends like sitting in the synagogue. When it comes to the rest of the week, we're all in our respective workplaces. There's no place for Mr. Nice Guy. Our person must be competitive, cutthroat, ruthless. After all, it's a dog-eat-dog world. And if you're not keeping ahead of the pack, you'll lose. The work week is not the time and place for vayakel, for unity and equality, a person may say. So by inserting the extra words, six days work may be done, right after the description of this ingathering by Moses, the Torah is telling us that the spirit of Vayakel carries over not only on the Shabbat when we're sitting on Friday night, when we rest, but also throughout the six days when we're at work as well. So this Shabbat six days divide is all too common. Walk into any uh, synagogue on an average morning, You see all kinds of people praying, learning, chatting over a cup of coffee and rubbing shoulders. No. But when the prayer books are closed and the suits and the ties are on in the office, oi, gewalt, a different kind of person emerges. All of a sudden, the person you shared that coffee with in the morning is is competition and you'll uh, you'll cut him down at the first um, opportunity. Others feel the need to assume an air of boss and think that they can't afford to share a kind word or joke in the break room. It chips away to their, uh, you know, their their attitude, or it may hurt their success. And the Vayakel divide can creep up in other parts of our life as well. Think about it. You have no problem being nice to your neighbors, sharing recipes, a spare egg, inviting them over for a Sunday barbecue every once in a while. Your kids go over to each other's houses and you'd be more than happy to have a beer or a a coffee together when things are quiet. These are the non-competitive, like let's call it the Shabbos-like, the Shabbat-like settings that don't really take anything off your back. So you're happy to be sharing by the Vayakel, the gathering comes easy. But when that same neighbor asks you to share a business contact or a number to your babysitter or tries to confer with you on a small matter regarding their tax return, then... (laughs) You're no nice. You're not nice anymore. I can't share my contractor's number with you. What if it gets too much work and isn't available when I need him? If I share my babysitter, they'll per- they'll certainly pay her more, and then I'll be on the hook for a raise. I can't answer this accounting question. It's my business. He should be paying me for such advice. Thoughts like these are undeniably common. But that doesn't make them appropriate. Such thoughts only occur when making the mistake that Vayakel, this gathering of unity, applies only to the Shabbat. So here's a handy reminder. Vayakel applies everywhere, including the six days shall be done. There's so much to talk about. I'll let let you think about those ideas. uh, And let's move on quickly. You know, uh, I want to say happy birthday to Sybil Trigoboff and to everybody whose, uh, whose birthday is in the Jewish month of Adar. Each month has a zodiac sign. The zodiac sign for the Hebrew month of Adar is fish. It may be surprising that many, that Judaism includes references to classical astrology, and the fish symbol has, has profound significance in both. I thought it would be appropriate to consider these creatures, but what they might teach us. Um, Kim, please pass me over that. Uh, Gefilte fish over there with the uh, horseradish. Thank you so much. Unbelievable. You know, this, this, in this studio, you get everything you ask for. Main, uh, number one, is what, what, is, what, what can we learn from a fish? Most fish cannot swim backwards. Eels may be a, a rare exception. Memories can, ign- uh, can ground us and help inform our decisions, but our sights should be set firmly on the present with the goal of shaping the future. To paraphrase the great teachings, as long as we're alive, we can still accomplish. Another interesting lesson we can learn from fish, everyone moves at their own pace. While sailfish can move at nearly 70 miles an hour, the dwarf seahorse can cover about five feet in the same time. The latter's pace is so slow that you can barely detect it's moving at all, but it is. Likewise, even if our pace is slow, 
It doesn't mean we're not progressing. Pro progress for one individual can look very different from that of another. We need not always uh, be a sailfish. We just need to make sure that we're swimming in the right direction. Another thing that I learned from fish, don't, they don't fall asleep on the job. Most fish rest, but they never sleep as humans do. They must remain alert to danger. When we've worked on ourselves and feel that we've reached a level of success, it's easy to let our guard down. But as Hillel the Elder said, do not trust yourself until the day of your expiration. Complacency can lead to backsliding and losing much of what has been gained. Let me throw in one more, a couple of more. Your, your, what do we learn from a, a fish? Pisces, those born in the month of Adar. Your sharp edges affect you too. The fang-toothed fish is, a, is several inches long, but its teeth are disproportionately large. It cannot even close its own mouth. Its teeth are so big. That physical constraint allows a lot of food to simply float away. Being particularly sharp or combative can be an advantage in some instances, but having extra sharp teeth might come back to bite us or at least leave us limited in our inability to maintain social connections. Number five, when a leader is needed, step up. Rusty an uh, angelfish are born female. In time, one will become automatically male and assume that role within the group. This teaches us about individual responsibility. Throughout our lives, we may rely on leadership figures to guide us. But when confronted with a challenge that requires us to step it up, we each have the potential to become that guide. Don't be a fish out of water. Fish needs oxygen, rich water to survive. The first century sage Rabbi Akiva was once asked why he continued to study Torah at a time when the Romans forbade it. He answered, uh, as water is to a fish, so is the Torah to him. God's teachings not only provide direction and purpose, but also the secret to survival. So you see, dear friends, there's so much to learn about the fish and I'm going to let it, let it go right at this point because otherwise it's going to sound too fishy. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl. Have a wonderful week. Stay well, enjoy, and zai gesund. Wishing you all the best. Thank you again. <laughs>